So you lived here, you married an American, you lived in this country, it sounds, happily from, let's just say, 86 to 2020. Mm -hmm. George Floyd gets killed, and all of a sudden, in a day, the country changes. What did you notice about those early days, late May, early June 2020, and what did it make you think as you watched it? It's a long time coming because uh, I start to notice things earlier, even as early as 1990s. And I remember in a class that I took, and it's about special education, when the uh, the uh, Act of uh, American Disability. The ADA, Americans with yes, Disabilities, yeah. 1990, 91. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. And the teacher was telling us, you know, now, you know, that they are protected. And uh, as uh, uh, teachers, um, that we should, I just took the class, but there are others that were uh, special ed teachers, that we should be very, very respectful. And we should never say blind. We should say people with vision, uh, impaired vision, something like that. I don't even remember. And I was so impressed. I said, the Americans are the nicest people. They try, you know, <laughs> to be nice and not, you know, not hurt people's feelings. And now we know, right? During the process, and we were taught, uh, you, you can't say uh, vision uh, impaired. Now it's something, something, something different. And now you know what? What's the correct way to call the, those people? Blind. Blind. Yeah, according to Stanford. Now that is the correct way. So that just reminds me of uh, the Cultural Revolution, that there is only one correct way of uh, thinking, of talking, and if you don't do it, you're getting into trouble. So I just noticed- So when the language started changing and people announced that, you know, from here on out, we're calling X, Y, mm -hmm. we're calling, I don't know, Peking, Beijing, or <laughs> the Orient Asia, or whatever, the blind, visually impaired, that reminded you of the Cultural Revolution. A little bit. I'm just saying, if you ask me what I noticed, yeah. that was something I noticed. Because I noticed later, you can't say that. You can't, there are so many things you can't say, or you have to say it differently. And who tell you? The authority tell you. That's the correct way of saying, saying things, and that's the correct way of basically of thinking. Okay, but still, I did not lose my uh, sleep over those things. And until later, and uh, um, in my book, I did say Trent Law probably is the thing, the person that came to my mind that I can really pin down. The moment I really say, this kind of really like cultural revolution. I don't even know the story, whatever. He was called a racist because he said something. I said, that really sounds like cultural revolution. You say something and your life is over. Trent Lott was a Republican senator from Mississippi who went to the funeral of the longest serving Republican senator from South Carolina, Strom Thurmond, and praised him at his funeral. And for that, he was... Forced to resign, right? Yes. Yeah. And that is that really made an impression on me. I think that's just like Cultural Revolution. And, uh, but things get from uh, bad to worse. And it was way before 2020 that I know that things is really, really going wrong because in the workplace, I was uh, uh, invited to be a member of DNI. Back then it's DNI, um, Diversity and Inclusion yes. Council. And I noticed every member is, has identity there. And I just realized this is not really about uh, uh, making people work together, help people work together. It's more like a, um, political identity. Yes. And uh, but things, you know, got so much bad in the uh, uh, 2020. When I saw the Antifa and the BMN burning our, our cities, I said, "This is no longer some kind of troubling sign here. Or there, this is a full." blowing Marxist revolution. This is exactly what I noticed uh, or what I witnessed during the Cultural Revolution. So I said, I got to do something. I have to get involved one way or the other. And that's the end of uh, uh, 2020. I got involved with the Loudoun, Republican, um, Loudoun County Republican Committee. And uh, after that, and uh, we get emails, you know, ask us to go to school board and uh, I was never, never involved politically to go and, and give a public speech. It was just intimidating to me. And, but I got so much support from uh, the members say, I said, I don't even have children in school at that time. They said, it doesn't matter. 
we all um, taxpayers, pay and then you should have uh, go there and, and voice your uh, your opinion. So I said, okay, okay. I've, I've been very alarmed about <clears throat> what's going on in our school. You are now teaching, training our children to be social justice warriors and to loathe our country and our history. Uh, growing up in Mao's China, all this seemed very familiar. The uh, communist regime used the same critical theory to divide people. The only difference is they use class instead of race. And back then, you know, you have to wear a mask. I said, thank God, I have to wear a mask and that to cover, you know, hide myself. So I went there and I did that. And I have no clue. I have no clue what happened after that. Well, I, ha I have to say one of the, the features, just as a foreigner reading about it, of the Cultural Revolution that's always struck with me, is the mass hysteria. Mm -hmm. Rational people becoming irrational. Mm -hmm. People going crazy, getting caught up in this frenzy and really believing things that are, that are absurd. I want to show you a piece of tape um, from the United States. This is after George Floyd's uh, drug overdose death. Um, and <clears throat> this is a table of affluent white ladies who have paid money to be told they're racist. And I just want to get your view of this. Watch this. Actually, Margaret, you didn't say yours. What? Your racist thing. Thing that you've done. Thought about or I done. Know. You have yeah. something inside of you that's not quite like that's racist. So you must have you must have examples in your own life. I also work in environmental engineering. I have absolutely no people of color or minimal people of color, possibly with exclusion of being slightly Hispanic. No. I mean, Saira doesn't you, like her attitudes. I can say a racist thing you've done because it just happened. When you just talked to me the way you just did, this is how white women talk to us all the time. These are microaggressions. When I say the exact same thing to my white girlfriend who says the same exact thing. I don't care if you talk to everybody like that. Okay. Right? The way you just spoke to me was straight up white supremacy. You actually just answered with racism. White supremacy so is said to be hidden in innocuous phrases and banal behavior. The smallest things could be considered racist. It's enough that a person from a minority group feels insulted. Absolutely. Sounding terribly white. I don't know that I was all that racist to start with, but I also would be more aware or hyper aware of my thoughts or reactions to circumstances that would be racist. So here we have privileged white ladies being barked at by even more privileged non white ladies about their sins, and the white ladies are loving it. Like, what is that? That's a struggle session. Yeah. And that's something that everyone has to go through. In the, during the Cultural Revolution, in, in the very beginning, there was those in power that was taken down by the Red Guards. They were struggled against in the so-called struggle session. That was brutal. Some of them were killed right there in a public trial. But everyone has to go through the gentler form of struggle session, and that's called criticism, and self-criticism. So as kids, we will have that kind of a struggle session every week. And we will sit together, and after you know, referring some of the mouse quotes, and we will uh, criticize self, you will start with yourself. And you would say, and uh, I did this and that, not quite up to the requirement by Mao's instruction. And, uh, and, and I still have this bourgeois influence in me, and, uh, and then everyone will join and say, yes, you're right. You did this and this that day. You said this and this that day. And then we go around. So we struggle against others and we're against ourselves. So to get rid of every little incorrect thoughts from our mind. It, That's what it is. So China is, I mean, overwhelmingly Han Chinese. So you're, you're not going to have racial lines in a country that's got one race. Um, but if you take the race stuff out, white supremacy, it, it's identical, right? Identity politics. That's exactly what it is. In China, it started with class. Yes. And they divide the whole population into two classes, red class and the black class. And you can figure out pretty much what it means. Red, uh, the correct class, and the black, is the incorrect class. Those are the uh, property owners, landlords, or people with bourgeois 
uh, worldview. They're all black class. So they are the enemy of the state. We all look alike, right? But that's how China was divided uh, by Mao. And I'm talking about identity. It's not something, you, you know, you say, oh, okay, I'm black class. No, you are black class, and that is your identity, and that is required in every government document. Just like here, race, you have to figure out, you, you have to fill out what your race, uh, what your race is. There, you have to fill out what your class is. And then you pass it down to your children, and your children's children, and you will forever be the enemy of the state. And here, we, ha we still have class. You know, both Bernie Sanders still talk about 1% versus 99%. Yes. But race is the most potent way to divide America. And that's just exactly the same thing that happened in China.